So hello everyone. We'll let people join the Zoom room. Thank you all for joining us today for our event in partnership with the Global Philanthropy Forum and the World Bank to talk about education and the impacts that COVID has had on education access around the world. Today, joining us as our moderator is Ben Holtzmer, who is the head of human capital at TPG. He has had a long career in leadership development and as an entrepreneur and a special interest in Latin America. But today he joins us in his capacity as a World Affairs trustee. He is the chair of our education program at World Affairs. Our education program focuses on building global awareness, leadership, and civic engagement. It offers opportunities to meet with international experts, work with local nonprofits, participate in global conversations, explore international careers, and study abroad options for local high school students here in the Bay Area. So we're very happy to have Ben here today, and I will turn it over to him in a moment to introduce the speakers. Just for a little bit of background for those of you joining us at GPF for the first time, we are a peer network of philanthropists and social investors committed to international causes. This program is a part of a series we're doing in the run-up for our annual forum, which this year will be taking place on October 19th, 20th, and 21st with the topic, Vital Systems, Healthy Communities, Finding the Next Normal. Please visit our website at philanthropyforum.org for more information and to register to join us then. And with that, I would like to thank you all again for joining and turn it over to Ben. Great. Thanks, Megan. Welcome, everybody. A special welcome to uh, Jaime and Lily and our partners at the World Bank today. Um, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, our guests and our panel here and um, set up the discussion for today. Uh, this is one of our efforts to have an important dialogue to kickstart um, discussions in advance of next month's Global Philanthropy Forum. And I think uh, all of us would acknowledge that education is perhaps one of the most important levers or instruments to addressing um, poverty, inequality, equality of opportunity, healthcare, environmental awareness uh, that, that we have um, at our disposal as a society. And so we wanted to um, have a special discussion today to focus in on this topic with two experts. And we're really lucky to be joined by uh, Jaime Saavedra, who is the Global uh, Director of the World Bank's Education Programs, uh, had also served as the Minister of Education in Peru for a number of years, where uh, after his tenure, there were measurable improvements in the outcomes and performance of the educational system. Um, and as an economist by background with a PhD in, uh, in economics from Columbia, and from what I can see in his podcasts and presentations, brings that lens to really looking at uh, holistically um, the, the ROI and the impact of investments and partnerships in education. So really excited to, to hear more from him today. And Lily Mulatu, uh, who uh, joined the World Bank in 1993 and has served, it looks like all around the world as an educational specialist, um, including a stint, a special assignment, working with the superintendent of schools in Washington, DC early in her career on uh, on educational improvements uh, there and has written and spoken extensively about teacher professional development and support, which I think is a, a really interesting topic. Hopefully we'll get to hear a bit about. And she sits, if I'm right, in Dakar today and is responsible for um, overseeing education programs in 13 West African countries, uh, primarily the Francophone world. So two really distinguished speakers and experts on the topic. And you know, from some of what I've read, um, and, and I think we've all experienced, um, you know, even going into the pandemic, educational inequality was a major global issue with something like 260 million um, children, you know, out of school, um, less than half of children in, uh, in middle income and low income countries able to sort of um, achieve basic mastery of reading, understanding a story by age 10. And then along comes the pandemic and 1.6 billion children out of school globally, major exacerbating uh, factors of inequality that already persisted before the pandemic and all the challenges that we're all aware of. Um, and here we are starting at least in the Northern hemisphere, uh, yet another uh, academic year with the pandemic still, still raging. Um, so really interested to hear from Jaime and Lily both um, what the state of play is globally, um, what the impact of the pandemic has been, but perhaps more importantly for all of us, um, 
you know, their perspectives on what the opportunities might be around partnerships and investment and new approaches and how we can um, lead coming out of the pandemic on this really critical topic. So that's the setup for today's discussion. Uh, Jaime is going to kick us off with a uh, a presentation and sort of global view, then Lily's going to follow uh, with the presentation on some of what's happening specifically in the part of the world she covers. We're anticipating that'll be about uh, 35, 40 minutes of presentation. We'll ask you to hold your questions to the end. If you have a particularly pertinent question, you can send it through the, the chat feature and I'll, I'll try to uh, weave it in. But if not, we're hoping to leave about 20 minutes at the end where we can have open dialogue and Q&A on, on what they've presented. So. Um, thanks again to both of you and to the World Bank. And Jaime, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Ben. Uh, before, let me see if I'm able to share properly my, my, my screen. Uh, okay, and so, let's see. I need to be able to move the screen as well. So no, it doesn't seem to be working well. So maybe if I can ask, um, um, yeah, I could have moved the slide. If I can ask uh, Jenny to to cover for me and um, and put this the uh, the slides up. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot, Jenny. So uh, so uh, thanks, Ben, for the um, for the introduction. And, uh, and to give us the, the possibility of, of, of sharing with this um, uh, network a few ideas about what's happening with education uh, and what's, what's also a little bit about what's the role of the World Bank. Um, in this juncture in which unfortunately you have to start saying that we're living the worst crisis on education of the last um, uh, 100 years, right? We have never had massive school closures um, all over the planet that have lasted in some cases three or four months, but in many cases, one or almost we're gonna be 1.5 years out of school. So this has been a gigantic shock to education systems. And this is a very strange crisis, uh, this pandemic. It's a, it's a, this pandemic is not hurting our physical capital. Our physical capital is fine in the world. Nothing has happened to it. The problem is our human capital, right? Our human capital is the one that is suffering tremendously with this crisis. Obviously, the most evident is with the health aspects of the crisis and the tragic, and that is as absolutely the most tragic part. But there's a more silent crisis, right? That is happening with uh, the minds of our young people. Uh, and the possibilities of the future of our young, of our children and young people uh, because of this um, um, education shock. Now, for a second, let me um, uh, share with you where, um, uh, where, where, we, where we were before uh, the pandemic. And, and unfortunately, before the pandemic, I, I would have said if this discussion would have happened in January 2020, I would have said that we were living a, a learning crisis, right? That we had a big trouble in education. Um, it, at the World Bank, and as you see in the next in the next slide, uh, we had an indicator called um, learning poverty, which is what's the percentage of children who could not read and understand a simple text by age ten, right? And if you think well, that indicator should be zero. All children should be able to read and understand a text by age 10, all of them, right? So if this is the percentage of those kids who cannot do that, right? That's what we call learning poverty, right? That percentage that unfortunately is a high number, that percentage is number should, that should go down, should go down eventually to zero. Unfortunately today, that percentage is 53%, right? But I'm talking about pre-crisis there. Right, and that's um, that's the number for low and middle income countries. Now, notice that the majority of those kids are in school. There are some kids that are not in school, but the majority of them are in school. And despite that, they are not getting right the fundamental skills that will they would they, they need in education and that they need for their lives. So that fifty three percent is already an extremely extremely high number. Unfortunately, with the crisis that number is going up 
as you see, if you if you if you move up, uh, our first calculation post COVID was that this number was going to or is going to increase from 53 to 63 percent. Now, unfortunately, this simulation was done at the end of last year, and we had the expectations that most school systems were going to return quickly at some point during 2021 or early 21 to education, to their to, to, to presential classes. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not the case. So we're revising this number now, and this number most likely it's closer to 70% than to 63%. So this is, this is really the worst education crisis of the century, as I point out in the next, uh, in the next slide. Um, on one hand is this uh, gigantic increase right, in the um, foundational skills, or in, the, in this case, in the lack of foundational skills of our, of our children. But in addition to that, if you move it, please, um, is that um, we calculate that could be easily 10 million kids who might not go back to school because of the disengagement that they have had from the schooling system. This number could be much larger, it could be 24 million if we think about early child education, basic education and tertiary education. Our calculation is that the, uh, this hit in terms of the uh, accumulation of human capital might have an impact in productivity and hence in lifetime earnings in the future which we calculate at this stage in about $10 trillion. That is equivalent about 10% of, of global GDP. And this gigantic number, that's the loss that we're calculating for this generation. We're not talking about losses because of the recession of last year, no. We're talking about how much this generation, those kids who are between five and 20 something, right, that should be in school or should be in, in a higher education institution, right, might get hit because of a reduction in their productivity, right? And it's, it's kind of the, uh, it's, it, it, it's a disadvantage that this generation might have compared to the previous and the next generation because of having lived during these years if we don't do something. Third, there's huge, yeah, well, there's each time more evidence, unfortunately, of mental health impacts because of the lack of socialization that this, that this crisis has generated. And unfortunately, we do have an inequality catastrophe. And why inequality? Because the experience has been very different for different children, right? For some children, both in rich countries and in poor countries, for some within each country, for some children, they have been able to, um, to have some interaction through Zoom with their teachers. They have books at home, a space to, space to study, teachers that can support them. And in the other extreme, you have children that have received no stimul education stimulation at all, right? Remember that some countries, we have tried to do our best in terms of remote learning, but I mean, with, with middle income countries, there will be an internet penetration of 50% at the household level or low income countries with a penetration of internet of 20% or 10% at the household level, it's difficult to do remote learning despite all the efforts that all education systems have, 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 have gone through or have, to have tried. So yes, all countries have tried to do their best in terms of remote learning, but definitely that never replaces presential education. Hence the experience of children have been I mean, dramatically different. And only for a small minority, we could say that they have had a decent education stimulation during the, uh, during the pandemic. Now, um, there are things that we need to do, right? And there's things that we can do. Right. And I want to mention to talk about those thinking about what are the lessons that this pandemic is bringing is bringing us. And the first lesson, I wanted to say that it's the two parts of this that I wanted to say that I, that I want to interrelate them. One is that we obviously we need to close the digital divide. We knew that there was a digital divide that exists that was not closed before the pandemic. We really need to invest in technology and make sure that everyone is connected and have and we invest in devices, in software, in teachers training, et cetera, so that technology can be an alley of education process. But at the same time, we have learned that education is a social phenomenon, right? Education is about interaction, both in schools and universities, right? It's about interaction between a teacher and a student, between a student and their peers. It's about teachers serving as a coach to facilitate learning and to inspire and to inspire students. 
right? That's extremely clear. That's even more clear than it was before. But then progress will imply, and in the near future, balancing those two things. Right? We need to recognize that education is a social phenomenon, hence the importance of teachers. But at the same time, we need to recognize that technology will be critical. And hence the future is about that balance between technology and the human factor, about technology leveraging the human factor right, in order to facilitate learning. But then the other set of lessons from this, uh, from this pandemic is uh, two things, is that the home and the community matters, right? Parents in the community are key players of their children's education. And that's something that is very clear for some parents, but it's less clear for other, for other parents. But hopefully with this pandemic, it's clear for more people that actually they are protagonists of the future of their children, both parents, the home and the community. And then it's important to strengthen the home and the community environment, right? We're really worried and we need to continue worried on making schools better, right? And putting all the resources that are needed in school in order to improve education. And that's great, but we also need to worry about what's happening at home, right? And to be something very simple, we need to make sure that in all homes, there's a book. There are books for children. And that's at, at this stage, that's not part of public policy. And that should be part of public policy. We need to worry about those conditions at home because resiliency requires precisely continuity of the learning process from school to home. And that resiliency is something that is another critical lesson of this, of this crisis. Now, so let me, let me move on and, and just mention that we do have a window of opportunity that has been open to build these foundations for the learning, for learning of the future, building on these lessons about the role of technology of parents, about the, the better understanding of, what's the, uh, of what's, uh, what's the role of teachers. And to do that, uh, we need the, the way we operate at the bank. I mean, we work with governments, right? And I would mention in general, we always have kind of like two fronts. If we go to the next, to the next slide, our first, our first area of work, and I'm going to spend two minutes talking about it, is that we have an education approach at the World Bank in which we see what are the different areas in which we have to engage in the complex structural reforms that are critical, right? Teachers reform, infrastructure, I mean, reforms that are essential in order to improve the quality of a system, but are reforms that might take time, right? But are absolutely indispensable if we want to increase the quality of an education system. But at the same time, as you see in the next, um, in the next um, arrow, we need to try to move the needle of learning in the short run, right? With the teachers that we have today. And that's why we, um, we craft something that we discuss a lot with the countries, what we call a literacy policy package. So a set of interventions that have to be put together in order to try to move the needle of learning in the short run, right? Now, unfortunately, now the situation is a little bit more complicated. And as you see in the next, in the, in the next arrow, in addition to the challenges that we have of, of improving structurally education systems, trying to improve the conditions of learning for children today, the children who are in the, in the, in the, in the classroom today, with this pandemic, we do have our, what we call mission recovery, right? We need to make sure that they will return to learning today, right? Today, and I'm really talking about September to 2021. There is a huge urgency today. Now, I cannot go into the details of the education approach. And just in these slides, you will, you will see, well, first of all, um, in, the, in the work with our countries, we cover all the, uh, all the education levels. Um, but in this education approach, I'm not gonna talk about all this. I mean, and we, can, we can circulate these slides, but there are five big areas in which we permanently work with countries, these five pillars to achieve systemic impact, right? We need to make sure that learners, that we invest in learners with the right early childhood development, right? Bol bolstering what's happening in the family and the communities. We need to work improve, I mean, improving the conditions of, of, of teachers in terms of selecting the right teachers, making teaching a socially valued career and investing right in high quality practical training for teachers. Third, there's a big area of work about learning resources, making sure that we have the right curriculum, the right pedagogical pro programs, I mean, the right textbooks, et cetera. Fourth, we're really worried about the conditions at school for schools to be safe and inclusive. And when I talk about safe, it's not only about infrastructure, but it's safe in terms of physical violence as well. Right? There is, there is there are physical and mental, I mean, all, all this related to violence and discrimination. 
right, that, are, that we recognize them, right, as a critical element that has to be tackled because it's a precondition for learning that kids have to, be, have to feel safe at school. And finally, we need to worry about management, right, from two perspectives, from the management of the school is a very complex institution to manage. Hence, we need to invest each time more in the school principal and also improving the quality of the bureaucracies, right, of the education systems, because it's an extremely complex system to, to work with. So when we work with governments, it's like, okay, so what is that we need to tackle in each one of these five areas? Now, and obviously many questions about, about this, but then that the other area, big area of work is in addition to all these um, complex reforms that have to be tackled in the short run, Right, we need to apply a literacy policy package to need to move the needle of learning, and that implies um, thinking of several issues. Right, but um, when 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 our teams are engaged at the at the country level, they think, they, they think okay, so what is what we're doing today, right, in order to assure that there's political commitment that we're measuring learning, right, that are supporting teachers today, giving them lesson plans in order to improve the capability the capabilities to interact better with the students today, right? Training that has an impact on Monday, right? We need to worry about uh, making sure that there are the right books and text that we teach children at the right level and that we engage parents and communities. These are complex engagements, but these are the things that we need to do if we want to move, to move um, uh, learning today, right? At the, at, the, at the classroom level. And then finally, I just want to mention is that in addition to, those, to these tasks, right? Today, we have uh, what we call Mission, Mission Recovery 2021, which is all the uh, um, efforts that working with governments are critical in order to, to accelerate learning, right? In the, as a, uh, now that kids are coming back to school, um, coming, um, I mean, after this long interruption. And as you see in the next, uh, in the next slide, um, we're working uh, jointly with UNESCO, with, with UNICEF, a lot in many in many of the countries, but we need to make sure that all children are back to school. So a lot of investment in um, in communication campaigns to make sure that kids really return return to schools, that they meet their basic learning, health, and social uh, psychosocial needs. That we engage in remedial education and accelerate learning. And also that we work with teachers in these very complex challenges, challenges that they will have because they're receiving kids who have been disengaged from the system for a very, very long time. So this is something that is about today, right? Where this is this is challenges that we really are facing, I mean, literally as, as we speak in the different countries. And finally, let me close um, uh, with uh, a little bit about what has happened in tertiary education. Gigantic challenges during COVID, I mean, it, it's, it's true that remote learning is, is easier at the tertiary education uh, level, but um, disruptions to uh, university life have been very large, but both from the regarding and, and increases in, in dropout rates and lower enrollments, disruption to research required in, 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 in person activities. And there have been different approaches to remote learning that I won't be able to, to, to cover, but in general, better engagement than in basic education, but very different from one region to the other, right? In Europe and in the Americas, there have been more engagement through remote education at the university level than in Africa, than in Africa or in, or in Asia. But huge challenges, again, in tertiary education and also tertiary education that it's an important part of the work uh, of the bank, as, as we see in the, in the next slide. We do have, um, uh, and this could be, uh, um, an, an entire presentation of what the challenges that we face in tertiary education. But we're talking about, and just one point that I want to mention is that when we talk about tertiary, sometimes we focus much more than what we should on universities. And we need to tackle the universities, but also the, uh, the whole te technical education system and make sure that when we talk about the tertiary education system, we're talking about an integration Right, of the different types of institutions. I mean, we cannot talk about universities and, and, and as, the, as the, a good path and technical education as a lower quality path. That's actually wrong, right? And then we need to have a integrated systems that bring those two worlds together. There's a huge space to work on, on technology and, and tertiary education. 
And one thing that I want to mention on this is the issue of equity, right? The big challenge for us is to make sure that everyone has the possibility of accessing tertiary education if they if, if they they if they want to and they have the and have the talent. And this is a critical area, not for middle income countries. Tertiary education is a critical engagement for low income countries as well, both from an equity perspective, but also from the perspective that a good tertiary education system is something that can drive growth in a country. So this is not a challenge for low income, for middle income countries. It's a challenge for both low and middle income countries. And finally, let me close this, uh, this presentation with um, a little bit about what the bank does. And that's what Lili is going to cover. We work directly with governments, there's loans, grants, and technical assistance. And we also work in terms of providing global public goods, what we call tools and resources in order to improve uh, the uh, the operation of education systems, and as you see in the next uh, in the uh, in the next slide, the um, uh, the the bank's portfolio is large. We're talking about 111 countries in which we're engaged. There's an active portfolio of 23 23 million dollars, and as you see in the uh, in the in the right side, it's a portfolio that has been has been increasing. And to, to, to operate on that, as you see in the next slide, I mean, there's, um, uh, there's a lot of partnerships that we're working with, and there's a lot of global initiatives, right, that are about how to measure learning better, how to support teachers better, how to and, and support accelerated learning, how to improve the quality of research and evaluation at the, uh, at the, at the, um, in, in education. All those initiatives are what you see there, and whoever is interested, I mean, we can we can facilitate all the information on those on all these initiatives. But at the end of the day, all these initiatives have to percolate to, at the country level, and at the end of the day, imply implies a, a very close interaction between the bank and and um, government teams in order to try to tackle what is that each country needs in order to support their to improve their education systems. And um, I will pass with that to Lily so that she can give us an example um, of how has this been tackled in a very specific uh, group of countries that actually have the highest rates of learning poverty in the planet. Um, but to, uh, to help us understand better the challenges in the Sahel countries, let me turn over to my colleague Lily Mulat. Lily, over to you, please. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jaime. Thank you, Ben. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for uh, inviting us to join you um, today. I'm going to uh, scare you a little bit with a few slides and then uh, hopefully leave enough um, sort of hope and, and, and potential on the table so that we can actually have a very open discussion. I will try to keep this to 15 minutes, if that's okay, Ben, um, but I'll go super fast. And please, uh, Ben, if you could give me one of these if I'm going too fast uh, so that I can, I can cover this. My favorite photographs are classroom photographs. And this one is especially wonderful because you see the children in the front holding their tablets, but you also see the moms in the back uh, themselves learning, but also making sure the kids are, are focusing. And so this is the kind of um, innovation adaptation that is happening now that is going to allow us to actually move the needle even in the most challenging of contexts. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna to talk to you about West and Central Africa Again, beautiful pictures. Um, it's, a, it's a region of 22 countries, half a billion people, and that population is, is expected to double in the next 29 years. The region is very heterogeneous. Don't worry about taking any kind of notes. I'm going to make sure that you get these slides. It's linguistically incredibly diverse, hundreds of local languages, plus a few um, you know, sort of infor, um, languages of instruction for each of the countries, incredibly varied, geography from desert to tropical forest, huge variations in size, Sao Tome and Principe or Cabo Verde are tiny little um, countries and you have the largest country in Africa in terms of population, which is Nigeria. Very low income countries all the way to high income, Equatorial Guinea has, is the richest country in the entire continent. And obviously uh, fragility and conflict are prevalent in quite a few of the countries. Next, please. No size fits all but we do look at some common factors and challenges across these countries. Rapid urbanization, almost half of the population now resides in cities, even though there's huge variation in the, in the region. Many countries are resource rich, actually they're resource dependent, 
because when those um, commodity prices shift, they are also um, hit hard by, by those shifts. We have uh, oil, gold, cocoa, cotton as, as some of the big resources and export commodities. Um, agriculture remains incredibly important. 82 million people are dependent on employment that comes from uh, agriculture. Uh, economic growth was very high in the mid 2000s, um, powered by the high commodity prices. But unfortunately, uh, as the prices were coming down, the COVID crisis hit. So we have a huge uh, shock to the entire economies of, of all of the countries in the region, huge human capital accumulation challenges, a human capital index of 0 0.38, meaning that the capital, the human capital in this region is only able to achieve 38% of its potential if things continue as they are right now. Uh, conflict, food insecurity, climate change are all coming together to threaten, uh, curtail, or even reverse some of the progress. And as uh, you'll see, COVID-19 is, is now really accentuating all of that. Huge crises across, uh, huge challenges again, fragility, incredibly rapid population growth, resource dependency, and climate change vulnerability is, is a sort of a, a running thread through these 22 countries. Next, please. There have been extraordinary gains made in, the, in expanding education. If you look at that you know, sort of solid line, look at the slope of that line. The gains from 1990 in, in primary enrollment for the children who are of primary enrollment age has been spectacular. If you look at net enrollments in secondary, it was actually quite high and then in the last 20 years has been even sharper and, and, and going straight up. So what we see is an enormous uh, amount of progress. Uh, and yet the education systems are in crisis. If you go to the next one, please. There's a huge unfinished agenda in terms of access, especially for the poor, for girls, and for those in rural areas. As Jaime showed, quality remains low and challenging, and I'll show you a couple of slides on that. And then again, COVID has led to huge losses in both learning and in access. Children who were pulled out of school may not, and in fact, we have evidence that they are not coming back in the numbers that we would like them to be. And this is especially too, true for girls. Next, please. COVID has left 101 million learners affected at the peak of the school closures. Now there's a little bit of good news, which is West African countries did not keep their children out of school for a whole year. Many of them did half a year. There were some countries that only had closures for 40, 50 days. And that became a, a rallying cry for households, mothers unable to work, and unable to work means unable to eat, uh, families unable to participate in petty commerce, in fishing, in, in agricultural activities, because there was a need to have somebody take care of the children. And of course, then older girls not being able to go to school because they were taking care of younger girls and younger boys. So as a result, many of the countries opted to put their children back in school, even though there was a huge risk of contagion. At that time, we didn't know that children were not going to be as susceptible to the alpha variant. There was a huge pushback from teachers who were really very scared and understandably so about their vulnerability but it, it became very clear that the costs were going to outweigh the benefits of keeping children at home, especially since contagion at home, uh, domestic violence at home, abuse at home, were going to be just as bad, if not worse, than having the risks that were associated with, with COVID. Next, please. So what we find is that education systems must learn to adapt to these new challenges, and we have to harness the opportunities. Jaime spoke eloquently about the digital uh, revolution that is necessary. You look at that uh, slide that is uh, evolving and you'll begin to see that the African continent has improved a little bit in terms of the number of internet users by country, but we never get to the really dark colors that you see in Asia, in North America, in Latin America, et cetera. Um, so the digital connectivity is growing, but it's growing at a much slower pace. Again, a glimmer of hope here, mobile connectivity and mobile access is extraordinarily high on the continent, over 90%, even for the poorest 20% of the population in individual countries. We have something we can work with there, but it's not yet at a point which we can actually take to scale. Urbanization, as I said, more than half of the population uh, or about half of the population is moving 
to urban areas, access and service delivery can be enhanced enormously, but pressure on scarce resources are also going to become, uh, is also going to become an issue. Next, please. So what is our vision for this region? We want this to be a region where all girls and boys arrive at school ready to learn, acquire real learning, and are ready to enter the job market with the right skills to become productive and fulfilled citizens. This, is, this vision statement comes from the World Bank's Western Central Africa uh, strategy document, which is under development. And we have a couple of team members if you are interested in having um, any more information about, about that document, which is in the middle of, uh, of being sort of finalized. Next, please. So our targets reduce learning poverty by 2024. We want a three to five year time horizon. We're not looking for 2050 or 2063. Um, empower girls through schooling. Increasing girls' education, especially at the secondary level, has huge benefits in terms of delaying marriage, in terms of delaying childbearing. And in fact, every single year of secondary school that a girl completes has a seven percentage point impact on her um, age of marriage uh, or early marriage and, and early childbearing. So the impact on demography, the impact on livelihoods for that individual, but also for society is exceptionally high. And finally, strengthening higher education and, and skills systems. Next, please. So let me talk to you about my favorite of my favorite countries, which is the five countries of the Sahel. Next, please. These are Mauritania, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, and Chad. They constitute 19% of the region's population, of the Western Central African population. So about 84 million out of 450 million. And this is a huge, mostly desert and arid um, part of the, of the African continent, mostly undiversified economies, heavily reliant on agriculture and commodity exports. All five of these countries are in, these five countries are in the top 10 in terms of demography, where average population growth is over 3%. In a few of these countries, that means that each woman is uh, on average having seven children or more. I have three kids. I cannot imagine having seven. And uh, I imagine for most of us, that's, prob that's probably true. Um, they have some of the lowest human capital outcomes. On average, 34, a, a child will realize only 34% of their potential in the Sahel versus the regional average is really low already at 38%. The, three, the four countries, Burkina, Chad, Mali, and Niger are both in the bottom in terms of their GDP per capita and urbanization. And unfortunately, they account for four of the seven countries that are sort of subject and, and sort of uh, victims of um, conflict, medium intensity conflict. Um, in Burkina Faso, I would go so far as to say perhaps even high intensity conflict. Chad has just had a change of government due to the death of the president. We have um, Burkina Faso that has one of the highest rates of, of school closures due to um, violence. Last year, I think about 330,000 children had to leave school, children that were precious to us in that they were the half that actually came to school and they had to leave their schools because of conflicts and, and the indirect targeting of those, of those schools. So we all know what's at stake. Livelihoods are enhanced if education is available. Gender empowerment is a huge um, benefit from expanding access to education, especially to girls, especially those who are in the poorest quintile especially to those who are in rural areas. Education is a driver of intergenerational progress. Better educated mothers have healthier and better educated children. Better educated teachers and healthcare workers and agricultural extension workers provide higher quality services. And then finally, education is a huge contributor to social cohesion and peace. And it's a very important indicator in terms of the equity initiatives that are coming from the state. Where the state is investing, where education is available, chances for social cohesion and peace are greater than where the state has disengaged and there is no presence at the village level of the state. Next slide, please. When we look beyond the sector, complex and interlinked and even intensifying dimensions of fragility and conflict are driving education challenges. I've already talked about extreme poverty, but where we see um, the poverty limits not just public, but even private investment um, in education. Parents will have limited human capital themselves, and they will struggle to offer their children 
a, a decent life. And yet in those areas, they're also shouldering the burden of about one third of education spending. Incredibly regressive, incredibly punitive, and a an really important indicator of intergenerational poverty that continues to weigh on, on families. I've talked about demography. The Sahel countries, my five countries, add about 1 million school-age children every single year. So even just to accommodate those, the amount of effort that is required is well beyond the capacities of these systems, well beyond the revenues of, the, of these countries. The most efficient country is still not going to be able to absorb that many, that many students every year. Conflict, as I said, as I already mentioned, um, is a huge um, driver of, 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 a ban of school dropout. Between 2017 and 2019, Burkina, Mali, and Niger had a six-fold increase in school closures due to violence. And it's not a, they're not starting from a small number. Like I said last year, 300,000 children in Burkina alone were not able to continue going to school. And then finally, education is only one of many crises. You see that I put just in, in parentheses. There's increased frequency and severity of climate shocks right now. This incredibly arid um, and semi-arid part of the world is suffering from floods that are coming more and more frequently and are much more severe, threatening their livelihoods. And now, of course, COVID is forcing households to, to take on coping strategies that actually negatively impact human capital. Next, please. So there is a progress, there is progress being made. In the last 20 years, in less than last 20 years, each of these countries has actually doubled the number of kids going to school from seven to 14 million. And you'll see some of the, the breakdowns by country for primary and for lower secondary. But as you can see on the right side, there's a huge surge in populations. And so they just have to run in order to, to stay in one, to stay in place. Uh, as Jaime says, that it's, it's running up a down escalator uh, just to keep up with what's going on. Next slide, please. Huge investments have already been made and huge progress is seen. If you look at the, the, the tallest um, graphs, it's in primary, sorry, those are in French. So it's pre-primary, primary, primary uh, first cycle of secondary or middle school, uh, high school, and then higher education. When you look at pre-primary, pre uh, so preschool education and higher education investments have not gone anywhere near where they should be, even to reach um, the, the limits for Western Central Africa. Uh, we won't even compare with the rest of Africa or the rest of the world. But the challenges are still huge in terms of access. Go ahead, please. Quality is astoundingly low. 85% of the children in Burkina Faso cannot read a text at age 10 and understand it. And that's the best of the countries. 99% of children in Niger are unable to read and understand a simple story at age 10. If you remember, that was 53% in, in uh, Jaime's uh, global table. And you see that there is a stark, stark quality problem in these countries. And, and Lily, so that, that's a percentage of children that are actually enrolled. Is that right? Correct. Or is that, or is that the total population? So in Niger, 99% of the children in school can't accomplish this task, is that right? No, actually, we looked at, no, these are all kids. This is, okay, all the population kids. as a this whole. A, okay. Yes. What would these but, numbers look like for, if you took the subset of students that are actually enrolled in, uh, in schools? So we've been looking at the PASEC um, enrollment, uh, sort of assessments that have been yeah. done. The numbers are incredibly low. Of the children who successfully master sort of the minimum uh, level for their grade, uh, so they're they're um, looking at children in grade two and grade six, and Niger and Chad in particular have abysmally low um, results in that in that uh, assessment. Next, please. And as you can imagine, those outcomes are the worst for poor rural children and for girls. I'm going to just quickly go on. Um, so what are we doing? We have a, an ongoing strategy, both for Western Central Africa as a whole, but also for the Sahel. And I wanted to sort of mirror what um, Jaime was saying. And we look at what are the game changers that we need to have in place today? What are the medium term policies and investments that are essential for sustainability? And then how do we build systems that are going to sustain this entire progress uh, sort of uh, um, trajectory uh, from 2030 and beyond. 
And so for us, it's the resilient recovery. Sorry, go back for me. Resilient recovery, going to scale with what works and focusing on highest priorities and looking at, of course, global evidence, regional experiences, and especially technology in order to sort of unlock this and then invest in systems that are going to go um, into the 2030 and beyond period. Next, please. So I'm going to quickly go through these. Communities are the most important factor. Um, Jaime touched on this, but for countries where the, the presence of the state is either very shallow or non-existent, communities are going to be the way to leverage much greater results for students and for kids. We see that in Chad, we see that in Mali, we see that in Senegal, we see that in Cote d'Ivoire. So whether the country is poor and high conflict or mature and, and emerging, um, the community role is absolutely essential. We have some great um, uh, data from Niger that just came out of the Japanese, uh, the JICA <coughs> initiatives together with the World Bank, where they have shown exceptional results from very community-based, very low-tech um, math initiatives that have helped uh, show improvements. And I'll be happy to talk about that. Next, please. Partnerships, and especially public-private partnerships, are the most important factor in extending the limited capacity of the state. We're no longer in situations where the state guards everything for itself and keeps out the, the private sector. Private providers in Mali have grown by two and a half percent just since 2000. 80% of general secondary schools are now private. 60% in 60% uh, of the um, schools in, in Chad, for example, 60% uh, of the school teachers in Chad are community teachers that are hired directly by households. Private schools are growing in Mauritania, reaching 50% of enrollments in Nouakchott. Quranic schools have a very long tradition in Sahel, and more and more we're seeing very innovative performance-based contracts between the, the formal school system and those Quranic schools in order to get real learning outcomes because traditional families are not willing to let their children go to the state school. Many out of children, out of school kids are also in these Quranic schools, and we're finding that being able to engage them is one of the most important ways of making sure that they get skills and competencies that give them a future once they leave those schools. And of course, targeting, financing, and effective performance management, not just of Quranic schools, but of all private providers, is important in order for the state to fulfill its stewardship role. We have great experiences in Senegal, in the Gambia, and Niger. That would be great if we would like to discuss it. Um, next slide, please. And then regional cooperation is really essential. For the Sahel, there's the Alliance Sahel, which is um, France, uh, the European Union, the African Development Bank, the World Bank, and some of the UN funds and programs have come together to coordinate their efforts around six priority areas, which include education. We have great regional um, work that is happening uh, the Sahel Women's Empowerment and Demographic Dividend or SWED project is one of our flagships in the region. We have an adaptive social protection program that leads to actual contributions or assistance to families so that they can actually uh, fulfill their basic needs. And then we have this amazing African, um, African Higher Education Centers of Excellence project or ACE, which has uh, had an impact across all of the countries, not just in the Sahel, but across the West and Central Africa region, or actually across the entire Sub-Saharan Africa. Lily, just so to, further, to, to weave sorry. in a, a couple of questions that are starting to come in. Um, okay. How, how does, you know, vaccine access impact uh, this over time was one of the questions. There's a lot of countries that don't have any vaccines, probably won't for some time. Um, how do you see that impacting, you know, the ability to get kids back and, you know, keep them in school and keep learning? <clears throat> and do you collaborate with, I don't know, um, the World Health Organization or others on yes. that, that topic? Yes. There's a huge vaccine um, support operation in the bank um, where a lot of different, both private and, and international organizations have come together uh, to support vaccine purchases and vaccine rollouts. Unfortunately, it's only about 3% of the population that is currently vaccinated. So it's almost not yet time to talk about its impact on, on schooling. But what is clear is that we have to have a very multifaceted approach to using all of the protocols that we know work in order to support uh, continued education in the face of not just the Delta variant or anything else that comes from now on. The most important thing we have to do is to use very basic things that work, washing your hands, 
distancing if you can. Most of my countries cannot distance. So masking, um, making sure that you keep an eye on, on symptoms and teach families to keep an eye on symptoms so that they are not sending children to school. Vaccinating teachers as a priority to make sure that they don't become vectors for the spread of disease um, in, in other countries. And especially working on not just availability, but also hesitancy. And that means really working very hard to fight misinformation, to share information in as honest and open way as possible, not try to sell this idea that vaccines are perfect or vaccines are demonic, yeah. uh, but really have a science and evidence-based yes. approach to providing information to households and families, I think is gonna be an essential, is actually an essential part of what we do. Yeah. Um, next one, please. I think I'm almost done. I have three examples of projects, so I'm gonna go through them, but I'm not gonna get into detail. I'm currently living in Senegal. It's one of, I consider my secondary um, country. Um, and this, we have an incredible um, early years program for early childhood education, but also early years um, uh, literacy learning. And we are trying to reach about 930,000 uh, kids with community-based health and nutrition services and enroll about 200,000 kids in early learning programs and register 600,000 uh, birth, uh, births. So which is a huge impact, huge uh, payoff uh, operation. Next one, please. In Niger, we have an incredibly innovative program called the Learning Improvements for uh, Results in Education or lire in French, which means to read. And it is uh, an incredible uh, focus. This is a project that has an incredible focus on learning, on reading, and on developing learning materials that are going to be then handed to children so that they are able to take it home and something that Jaime has mentioned. And then my last example is in Burkina Faso where we have about 4,000 students in seven public and 14 private um, higher education institutions we're going to get this uh, program of study. There was a huge uh, initiative to uh, partner with private institutions to offer them laptops. And you've never seen so many happy kids. There were tears, there was excitement because not only were, the, were they offered the, the laptops, but they were offered the content and the connectivity so that they are able to actually access the content um, at a time and a place that makes sense for them. Next, please. So I wanna end by saying, look, the challenges are daunting. Uh, there's not a day that goes by where Jaime and I, when we are discussing what's happening in the region, we don't feel overwhelmed, but we don't, we don't feel like we are paralyzed into inaction. In fact, this is a huge motivator to find the right partners, find the right interventions, and to make sure we have sufficient resources available to the countries so that they're actually able to meet this huge um, challenge. So I hope that we have an opportunity to be able to discuss that. Thanks. Thank you both. That was a, a remarkable uh, setting of the stage of what's happening both globally and, um, and in West Africa. I know in a short period of time, we've only got a few minutes left for Q&A, but um, I'll put two questions to, to both of you, one from the audience and one of my own. Um, one of the members of the audience wants to know, how do you think COVID will have had permanent or structural impact on education globally, or is it more transitory? And then the second question I have for all of you as we, in the lead up to the Global Philanthropy Forum, I'm curious to hear what partnerships you think are most effective, NGOs, philanthropies, private public partnerships, like what are the things we should be thinking about that can really move the needle on these um, ambitious and important goals you guys have put out there? Um, let, oh, so, sorry. Okay. Um, very quickly, I think there is room for everyone. As you heard me talk, women's associations and villages have a role to play as private actors who are interested in the success of schools. And you know, Gates Foundation or so, you know, a large, a large international um, organization like the World Bank has a huge role to play. The reality is, we need every single partner to come in and to do what can be done in a coordinated fashion and where the, the government has enough of a, of a regulatory role or a stewardship role that it can actually coordinate all the different partners. And where the government is unable to do that, it is on us to coordinate those different partners. But this is going to be an important 
part of the puzzle for me, for us. So there's room for every single type of partner. And the question is really going to be bringing the right uh, partnership together and to meet the actual need under the stewardship of the, of the government and of the, of the actors at, at, the, at the field is what I would say. Um, Jaime? Thank you. Thank you, Lily, and thanks, uh, Ben, for those two, two questions. I think the key point here is to make sure that there is no permanent effect or impact on this generation. That is the key thing, right? That there is nothing, that this generation is not hurt at all by having lived in a moment in which we have this gigantic shock and school closures. That's the key thing. Now, and we need to build on that, right? So we want that to see a zero permanent impact. Right? But where we do want to see a permanent impact is in that renewed role of the different stakeholders. And that's what I, what I was saying that one of the lessons of this pandemic is on one hand that we have a better understanding of the potential and the role of technology. But on the other hand, we have a better understanding of the critical human aspect of education, right? From the role of the teacher on one hand to the role of parents and communities on the other. Right? And the role of communities is even larger and stronger and, and more critical, even in the short run, right? in spaces like, uh, like West Africa that Lily was, was, was explaining. Now, of course, we need in no cases stronger government systems. Right? We know that public education systems are absolutely critical aspect of equalization of opportunities. So we need to continue uh, working, working with them. But I think a critical aspect of this, of this pandemic, and it's a critical lesson, Right, is that we need to invest in technology, but invest in the role of the different stakeholders. Right, that is not only the, the what's happening in school. It is the school, but it's also is the community and its parents and its society as a whole that they really have to have a critical understanding of the magnitude of the crisis and how important it is to build back and build forward a better system for our kids. Ben, can I can I jump in on the on the on the COVID crisis? If ever there was yes. a crisis not to waste, it was this one, and it is this one. Not only has it been devastating, but it has helped us to question some of the most stagnant parts of education systems: curricula, teacher roles and responsibilities, inspector roles and responsibilities, materials, technology, equity, um, you know, inclusion asynchronous uh, opportunities for learning instead of you know, being rigid with school calendars. Um, hybrid learning that allows for both online and, and in-person learning. We were able to have conversations with ministers and with key stakeholders in education, including unions, that were unthinkable two years ago because every single person realized that closing every single school in a country is no is is nobody's interest. Like whether you want strikes and civil you know civil um, unrest, uh, a lot of people can 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 come forward with very good reasons for why schools should be shut down for one day for two days, but all of us were paralyzed in fear when we saw all of these schools closing. So not only does COVID represent the biggest threat to education, but in many cases it has allowed us to have huge conversations that were previously impossible. And so not only uh, do I see this as a, as, a, as a huge challenge, but I see this as a huge opportunity as well. I think that's a great note to wrap up on at the top of the hour. Um, so much great information and insight um, and sobering challenge, but an optimistic note. And I think uh, you're right, crisis not to be wasted. So I, I really hope we can all continue this conversation uh, offline and at the Global Philanthropy Forum and our ongoing collaboration with the World Bank. So uh, on behalf of uh, all the attendees, many thanks to both of you, uh, Lily and Jaime, and um, uh, to be continued. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ben. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.